in the book of Colossians, Colossians, the third chapter. Ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, is idolatry, to which things take the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. You lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds, put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. For there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now these opening verses, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, with Christ that is on the right hand of God. Now Easter has come again, and tonight, about 9.30, for millions it will go again. And I'm just a little saddened by the fact that it makes for a great many people mark the end of all spiritual concern. I do not wish unkindly to criticize or censor, because if that's the best these friends know, I suppose it's the best they can do. And if they're doing the best they know, they're doing better than some of us who know better than we are doing. So we will turn to the positive side and let our hearts ache. We see the church is packed this morning and empty or half or two-thirds empty next Sunday. And we'll talk about uh, this text and about Christ and the people that belong to him. Now it is written here, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. And I'd like to point out to you that Christ triumphed over death was the foundation and fountain, and it was everything to these enraptured believers of the first century. When Christ rose from the dead, at first it was amazement, and then to them it became joyful wonder. And then a radiance of conviction supported by many infallible truths, witnessed to by the Holy Ghost. Now this became to the first Christians the reason for everything. This battle shout that he is risen and will risen with him became to them a cry of courage. That in the first two hundred years caused many thousands and hundreds of thousands of them to die as martyrs. For those early Christians, Easter was not a day at all. Easter was not a holiday, nor even a holy day. Easter was not a season. Easter was an accomplished, tremendous fact, which lived with them all the year long. And it became a reason for their daily conduct. He lives, they said, and we live. He triumphs, and in him we triumph. He's with us, and he leads us, and because he leads us, we follow on. <clears throat> they turned their backs on the sepulchre, 
and they turned their faces toward a new life, an altogether new life, because Christ had risen from the dead. They did not celebrate his rising from the dead, and then sagged down leagues below the celebration, and wait for another year to pull them up out of the mire. They lived by the fact that Christ had risen from the dead, and they had risen with him. Now it says here, if then ye be risen with Christ, but I want you to know that that word if is not an if of uncertainty. The force of the word is sin. We are then risen with Christ because Paul so declared in chapter 2 of this epistle and in Ephesians 2, 6-7 and in Romans 6, 4 and elsewhere <laughs> that when Christ rose from the dead his people rose with him morally rose with him, spiritually rose with him and that this rising from the dead was and is an accomplished fact. Now he says, since ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Once more I'd like to point out that success in the Christian life is not automatic. The soul must be cultivated like a garden, and the will must be sanctified and become Christian. And uh, we, we must become Christian through and through, and uh, heavenly treasures must be sought. We must seek, says Paul, we must set, says Paul, and we must mortify, said Paul. Now, setting means to fasten, and we must set our affection above. We must seek those things which are above, and to do that we must mortify the things which are below. This is written here in the New Testament. It isn't written much in the annals of the modern saints, but it is written in the New Testament, and it's here for us, and we'll be judged by it in that great day. Now those things which are above, what does he mean by that? This is not as vague as it may sound or seem to be. They can be identified, those things which are above, by a contrast. We may draw a line down the middle, and over on the left hand we'll put the things that are of the earth, and over on the right hand opposed to them the things that are of heaven. The things that are of the earth belong to sight and reason and our senses. The things which are in heaven belong to faith and trust and confidence in God. Over on the left hand we put pleasures of earth. And over on the right hand we put the delight in the Lord. On the right left hand we put treasures of earth. And on the right hand we put treasures above which neither moth nor rust can rot nor take away. And on the left hand side we put reputation among men and our desire to stand well with men. And on the right hand we put a desire to stand high with God. And over on the left we put a rich dwelling here, and on the right we put a mansion above. On the left we put a desire to walk with the best company here below, and on the right we put a desire to walk with God here below. And on the left we put to follow man's philosophies, and on the right we have to follow God's revelations. On the left it is to cultivate the flesh, and on the right it is to live for the spirit. And on the left it is to live for time, and on the right it is to live for eternity. By contrast, we see how different we are to be, we Christians. We are to be so different from the world and completely different. Now to go down on that left-hand side, you have sight, reason, and senses, and they give you the pleasures of the earth and make you want the treasures of the earth. They make you want the reputation among men in a rich dwelling place here. They make you want to walk with the best company and follow man's philosophy and cultivate the flesh and live for time. And the things which are of God make our faith and trust and confidence in God. And they make you delight in the Lord and uh, to treasure the, the, uh, the treasures and value the treasures which are above. To want to stand high with God and to have a mansion in heaven and to walk with God below and to follow God's revelation and to live for the soul and and to live for eternity. Now there's a contrast you see. It, it, it's a great job fixed and it's fixed and it stays fixed. And Paul's writing to Christians now 
We make a great mistake and we're always doing it. And I wonder why we're always doing it. We ought to know better. We're always confusing the world with the church and we're trying to get the world to do what we have difficulty getting Christians to do. And we're always preaching sermons and writing articles and singing hymns trying to equate our countries and with modern civilization or any civilization with Christianity. It can't be done, my brother and sister. The Christian church is something apart. The Christian church is not black nor white nor red nor yellow. The Christian church is not Canadian or American or British or German or Japanese. The Christian church is a new creation born of the Holy Ghost out of the stuff of Christ's wounded side. And it's another race altogether. And it's another people, a race that's lifted above this present fallen race. And now we're to be different from the world. If because ye are risen with Christ, then seek those things which are above and set will to set your mind on the things which are above. For Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, and that is the heartening truth, my brother. I preached last week down in Connectedy in Albany, and preached two and three times a day, one night only once, I only got there in time. And then uh, I was among the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists and the Methodists and the few land people scattered around. Well, I, it's all right, I guess, but, um, you know, I like, I told them there, and I want to tell you now, that uh, I can't get too steamed up about the holidays and the holy days for the reason that every Sunday's Easter to me, every time I get up Sunday morning, Christ is risen. And every week is Holy Week, and every Friday is Good Friday, and every Thursday is Maundy Thursday, though I don't know what that means, I'm sure. I have the faintest idea of what Maundy means. I'll look it up sometime, remind me. But uh, for that reason, I, I enjoy walking with God all the year round, and one day is not better than another day, and one week's not better than another week, and one Sunday's not better than another Sunday. Too bad now, wouldn't it be too bad if you had to wait another year in order to get blessed? The scripture teaches that Christ is out of the grave and is alive forevermore and is consciously present to those who have faith and he's here now and he gathers with these people wherever they meet, any time they meet, whether it be in a coal mine hiding from persecution, whether it be in a mule barn or whether it be in a cathedral, wherever the people of God are gathered, there am I in the midst of them and they minister to the Lord and pray and the Lord says to them, pick out this man and that man and send him out as a missionary. And so the church of Christ lives because Christ lives. Because I live, ye shall live also. And it doesn't depend on the seasons of the year and whether it snows or not. Christ is out of the grave and he'll never be back in that grave again. He never went back in and he will never go back in. Death has no more dominion over him. So because he's risen from the grave, it is ours then to be risen also with him and to seek those things which are above. Now there are certain imperatives before us because Christ is risen and every eternal holy voice from heaven above cries and exhorts that we should perform these and live within them. It says set, seek and set, seek and set your affections on things above and put off the old ways and forgive everybody and live kindly in the world and uh, dedicate our time to him. Too often we give God only the tired remnant of our time. If Jesus Christ had given us only the remnant of his time, we'd all be on our way to that darkness that knows no morning. But he gave us not the tired remnant of his time, he gave us all the time he had. And he gave us all he had. Some of us give him only the tattered relics and remnants of our money and of our talents and of our gifts and of our time. But the Lord Jesus Christ gave it all, and because he gave it all, we have what we have, and he calls us as he was, so are we in this world. Now, if we tried it this year, if we tried it starting out now as though Christ had risen this morning, if we tried it, we could do a great deal this coming year. We could make our time work for us. We could attend at least one prayer meeting each week, and everybody should, and every Christian should. Attend at least one public prayer meeting every week. He should have many, many prayer meetings a week with his Lord. David said, morning, noon, night will I pray. 
Others have had other rules they've followed, and they've had prayers and prayer meetings all the week long. But you know, because we're a, we're a group, we're a people, we're a company, we're a family. The family ought to get together in the church at least once a week. And so, if we give and dedicate our time to Him, because He's risen from the dead, and we're risen with Him, and we're another kind of people living another kind of life. And I say that we could have at least 52 prayer meetings under our belt as, as trophies of a year well spent by the time next Easter rolls around. And we could maintain a sweet private prayer life too if we gave our time to him. And we could accomplish a hundred fruitful works that we just haven't accomplished because we've put them off. Our time is not dedicated to the Lord, only a relic of our time. Since then Christ is risen, be ye risen also, since you are also risen, and seek those things above, and turn your mind over to him. I said we ought to have Christian minds. Our difficulty is we're, we're, we're religiously divided. We have a secular mind and a religious mind, and with the secular mind we do most everything that we do, Then we have a little private part of our mind we call the religious mind. And that with that religious mind, we try to serve the Lord the best we can. Don't you know that you should not have any secular mind at all? Don't you know that when you're a Christian now, you seek the things that are above, and there should not be any worldly mind in you? But you say, how can I pursue my studies? How can I do my housework? How can I carry on my business? You carry on your business and do your housework and pursue your studies by making them as part of an offering to God as certainly as the money you put in the plate or anything else you give uh, openly and publicly to God. I do not believe in this divided life, this life that is partly secular and partly spiritual, partly of this world and partly of the world above. I don't think it's New Testament at all. I think that it came to us because of the evils of tradition down the centuries. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We can turn some of the most hopeless jobs into wonderful spiritual prayer meetings. If we'll turn them over to God, it was Nicholas Herman, Brother Lawrence, who said that they made him wash the dishes in the little institution where he was. And he said he used to do those dishes to the glory of God, and when he was through, fall down flat on the floor and worship God. Whatever they sent him to do, he did that for the glory of God. He said, I wouldn't as much as pick up a straw from the, from the, from the floor, except I did it for the glory of God. And I heard of one saint who praised God every time he took a glass of water. He returned thanks. I don't think he made a production out of it, but I do think that in his heart he thanked God. Every time I leave my house. I look to God and expect him to bless me and keep me on my way, and every time I'm in the air, I expect him to keep me there, and I expect him to land me safely, and I expect him to bring me back. The day he wants me in heaven more than he wants me on earth, and he'll disjoint that prayer, and it'll all be over, but I'll be with him there. But in the meantime, while he wants me here, I'll thank him every hour and every day and for everything. So let's, be, let's not have secular minds and worldly minds Let's have sanctified minds, and if we have to do worldly jobs, if they are earthly jobs, then do them with a sanctified mind, and they're not worldly anymore. There is much a part of an offering to God as anything else that you could do. And I would suggest, and this seems out of, out of mood on Easter, because we go in big for flowers and nice music, but I would say begin to tithe your money. This year, if you haven't done it before, start this Easter. It'll be a wonderful time. You say, I have it so badly in debt. You'll get out of debt faster if you tithe than you do if you don't tithe. And you'll have more left at the end of the year. If you give generously to the Lord's work. The Lord, old Paul Ray used to say, the Lord won't be in debt to anybody. If you give, the Lord will give back to you. Someone said he had to shovel and God had to shovel. He shoveled and God shoveled. God shoveled into his granary and he shoveled back into the church and he said God's shovel was the largest, larger of the two, and so he got more always than he gave. I believe it's true. So try it, try it. You say, but I'll be bankrupt. Try it. There was a day when we felt we couldn't give a tithe and then the government came along took 20 to 30 percent of it. We take it and then we're supposed to tithe on top of that. Now, don't tithe what's left over after your tax collector gets his cut. Tithe your entire income, your gross income. God has no deductions and no exemptions. He 
says, here, turn it over to me and I'll multiply it and turn it back. Try it. Dedicate yourself to him. Somebody says, are you preaching now? Well, you may get more. I wouldn't get more. If you gave a million, I wouldn't get any more of it. So don't worry about that. I'm just talking to you out of my heart. Christ is risen, and we're risen with him, and we are to sit at the right hand of the Father with him in spirit, and one of these times with him actually in body. And so in the meantime, we're to act as if we were up there. We're act a little bit different. Farm boy comes to the city, and he acts different because he belongs on the farm, and the city boy goes to the country and he acts different because he uh, belongs in the city. The man who hasn't been on the farm walks around gingerly, tramps around, keeps out of the mud and tries to keep his shoes from getting soiled. He's acting like a city man on the farm. And when you and, you and I are Christians, and we ought to act that way. We belong up there and our culture belongs there and everything belongs there and our manner of speaking and our manner of thinking belong there. And, of course, when you're down here, you act a bit odd, and the people will recognize you, and they'll say, that's all belongs in heaven. I know a lot of people that does it. They belong in heaven. I suppose one of the homeliest things in all the world is a goose walking around on the earth. One of the most graceful sights in the sky is a wild goose with her wings spread, wings stretched on her way south or north. And I suppose that we act awkward down here because we belong up there. Seek those things which are above where Christ is on the right hand of God. Some of you secretaries who are in the, in, in the big offices where you're surrounded by half a dozen anywhere up to 25 or 30 others. And when coffee break time comes, you can't sit into the conversation and you act awkward. And you're kind of worried and you came to yourself and you wonder why. Well, you're because you belong to God and you've got another spirit and you know another language and you talk this world's language with an accent. And when they mention religion, they talk it with an accent. They belong to the earth and you belong to skies. And of course the two don't agree. They think we walk awkwardly down here, but they haven't seen us with our wings spread yet. Wait till the time comes that the children of God spread their wings and soar away to meet him in the glory. And uh, they'll say how graceful they are. How graceful. But while we're on earth, of course, they don't think so. Then I'd suggest also, since Christ is risen and you are risen with him, that you start family prayer if you don't already have it going. Start family prayer. But you say, I can't possibly do it. I have to get up too early. Well, then have an evening. But I can't do it. Have it sometime. There'll be, a, there'll be some time when you can have family prayer. You say, I can't keep the children. Let them wiggle. Let them wiggle. Have family prayer. Get somewhere a time when you can at least have a few minutes. And don't read any of these homemade canned things that you buy to get over with. Read the scriptures. Teach them to read the scriptures. Our young people get converted and get up the first time to read the scriptures. They don't know how to read it. They haven't learned. Because they haven't learned it at home. Teach them to read the scriptures. And don't worry about the King James Version. They'll catch on to it in no time at all. They'll soon know what a thee and thou and all the rest means. Read it. And so have your home a Christian home. Well, he says, your life is hid with Christ in God. How can I comment on such a passage? Your life is hid with Christ in God. Divides itself up. Any preacher couldn't preach on this ought to sell insurance. Because uh, your life is hid with Christ in God. Notice it. It divides itself up like an orange when the skin's taken off. It invites any preacher to preach it. Your life, point one, is hid, point two, with Christ, point three, in God. Point four, and you can have your own conclusion. Here are the jewels from the earth and the sky. Here's safety and strength and assurance, and here's the cure of all fear. Your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ shall appear, there's the hope of it, church, when Christ shall appear. He came out of the grave and is alive forevermore. And when he shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. That's the hope of the church. Not all the details. We were too smart a generation ago, and we thought out all the details. Everybody knew exactly everything that could be known about prophecy. Now we've swung the other way, and everybody's afraid to mention it. Because we've been, the props have been kicked out from under our, some of our views. But I, they can't kick this prop out, that Christ shall appear, and you shall appear with him in glory. And there's no question about that. He will come, and when he does come, you'll be with him in glory. Just as you were with him when he died and with him when he rose, you'll be with him when he comes in the glory. And in the meantime, you're supposed to act like it. That's the whole meaning of the Lord's Supper, incidentally. 
coming, death too is coming, and here's the end here, and here's a little bracket in between. We're living in the historic bracket in between his rising and his coming again. Ye shall also appear. Saints are veiled now, and so are the hypocrites veiled. But in that day they will be unveiled. And it says, with him in glory, you know, I'm much more concerned with the with him than I am with in the glory, much more concerned. He shall appear with him in glory. With him is much more interesting to me than in glory. Because if you have him, you'll have the glory. Just as the bride who must be separated for a little while from her bridegroom writes him letters eager and sends him telegrams and calls long distance. She wants to be with him. He's out there somewhere trying to get a home together, a house together. He says, I don't care about the house, I want to be with you. Isn't the house and the trimmings and the appointments and all the rest, it's he that she wants to be with. Did I get that right? He, him, or he. It is he that she wants to be with. And so it is, it's Jesus Christ that we want. Jesus Christ. The glory will take care of itself. I read the Bible, the Revelation, and the hymns, and I try to learn what I can learn about the glory, but I've got a feeling that most of us don't know too much about heaven yet. We may be surprised with what we see there in what we call the glory. You can't know any more probably than you do know until he comes, but you can know him with increasing intimacy. And by knowing him, we will know the glory because he is the glory of that place. And the Lamb is the light thereof. So now, my friends, let us take this Easter day, not as a day at all. Let us take it, take it as one more celebration of an accomplished fact, something that has been done, that's over and finished. He is risen. He can never go back in the grave and he can never die again, never bleed again, never suffer again. Except in his heart, he suffers for the backslidden sons of God. But that's an accomplished fact. And the second accomplished fact is that we are risen with him. Now it's our business to cultivate this. And to seek those things which are above where Christ that is on the right hand of God. God grants that we may that we may be better Christians next year than we've been this. Amen. End of sermon. End of sermon. Thank you for watching today's video. This channel is brought to you by HopeLify.org to inspire you to become the very best that you were designed to be. Remember, a few simple keys, mastered and consistently applied, are often all we need to excel in each area of life. You can help make this channel even better in three simple ways. One, subscribe to receive more videos. Two, leave a comment below to let me know what resonates with you from today's video. Or three, suggest a topic for a video that you will like for us to feature on this channel. Visit Hopelify.org to post your own inspirational content.